afternoon. My name is John Strope. Welcome to History Nebraska's Brown Bag History Lecture Series. Lectures are held monthly on the third Thursday here in the Old Father Family Auditorium at the Nebraska History Museum in downtown Lincoln. Learn more about History Nebraska and our programs and services at history.nebraska.gov. If you are not a member of History Nebraska, I encourage you to join. Your support allows us to provide programs like the Brown Bag Lecture Series free for all Nebraskans. For a full list of membership benefits, visit our website. Special thanks to the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for the financial support which allows us to tape and broadcast these programs across the state. We'd also like to thank LNKTV, a service of the City of Lincoln, which produces these shows. If you enjoy today's programs and would like to watch previous Brown Bag Lectures, visit History Nebraska's YouTube page at youtube.com slash History Nebraska. There are, I think, 170 or so now. Our speaker today is Joe Starita, NU Professor of Journalism. Interested since his youth in Native American history and culture, Joe returned to his native Nebraska in 1992 to research and write The Dull Knives of Pine Ridge, a Lakota Odyssey. His third and newest book, A Warrior of the People, is a biography of Susan LaFleche, the first Native American doctor in this country. Four years ago, Joe established the Chief Standing Bear Journey for Justice Scholarship for Nebraska Native American high school graduates. To date, the scholarship has been awarded to 18 Native graduates of Nebraska high schools. Pictured here is Aaron Rave, one of the 2018 scholarship winners from Omaha Nation High School in Macy. Erin will use her scholarship this fall to attend the Haskell Indian Nations University in Lawrence, Kansas. Email joe at jstarita2 at unl.edu to learn more about this great idea. Joe's second book is I Am a Man, Chief Standing Bear's Journey for Justice. And this book provides our topic for today, Chief Standing Bear's Journey for Justice. Just to let you know about asking questions, Joe prefers you wait until the end to ask. Please join me in welcoming Joe Starita. Thank you very much, John. Um, I always say this at the beginning of my talks, and I always mean it, which is I don't think authors in general are as uh, grateful as they should be for these kind of opportunities and appreciate the fact that you have all come out and busted up your day a little bit and braved perhaps uh, some rain to get here, and I don't want to be one of those authors who doesn't respect that and doesn't appreciate that, and so I want to get that uh, conveyed to you right off the bat. Um, okay, uh, there's a lot that I want to say about uh, this topic that I, um, this was my Moby Dick for about three years. I'm obsessed with this story. I love this story. I love so many stories that emerge from the native soil of this state. When I was in New York for four years and had a good idea, I would get excited about it. I would look around and see that there were 61,329 people with the same idea standing behind me. When I came here and uh, looked uh, over the potential story ideas and I got excited and I looked around behind me and I could see all the way to the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> Nobody there. So I feel in many ways like a, uh, a, a, a child let loose in a uh, literary candy store because there are so many great stories that emerge from the soil here and um, we need to make sure that people know about them. We need to raise the profile of the Standing Bears and the Susan LaFleshes and uh, we're going to do that. We're going to keep hammering away on that. Just out of curiosity, is there anybody in this room who has ever been to the caves of Lescaux in the southwest corner of France? Anybody ever been 
to the Caves of Lascaux. Anybody ever heard of the Caves of Lascaux? Okay, good, excellent. The Caves of Lascaux, for those of you who have not heard of them, are a series of caves in the southwest corner of France. If we were magically transported to the Caves of Lascaux right now in that southwest corner of France, we could walk in and we would see on the walls of those caves pictographs, pictographs, pictographs that tell a story of a specific group of people at a specific place in time and what they were doing in that place in that time. And those pictographs on the walls of the Caves of Lesko are the oldest form of storytelling that we have in the world. Those walls have been carbon dated back to 17,400 years ago. Oldest form of storytelling that exists on our friendly little planet. We need those stories. We need the stories of Homer and Virgil and Aeschylus and Shakespeare and Milton and Hemingway and Steinbeck. And for my money, the best writer that America has right now, a woman by the name of Louise Erdrich, I'm sure a number of you have heard of her, Ojibwe woman who lives in Minneapolis, who several years ago won the National Book Award, first Native American, male or female, ever to win that award. We need those stories. We have always needed those stories because those stories from yesterday tell us who we are today and foreshadow who we are going to become tomorrow. This literary DNA is what helps us understand who our ancestors were and the issues facing them and the values that emerged from the trials and tribulations that occurred in their lifetime. And so these stories are always very important. Stories are important. And I wanna tell you this afternoon about a story that is very important to me and to all of us in Nebraska and beyond Nebraska. It's a story about a middle-aged chief of a small tribe living in an obscure corner of the Central Great Plains who managed to bring the entire government of the United States to its knees in defeat without ever firing a shot from his Winchester, without ever plucking an arrow from his quiver, without ever unsheathing his scalping knife. But this remarkable individual, Chief Standing Bear of the Ponca tribe, was able to defeat the United States government in a courtroom 60 miles east of where we are now, corner of 15th and Dodge Streets, on the third floor of this monolithic Yellowstone building that served as the federal courthouse in the 1870s, with, of all things, a writ of habeas corpus. He was able to use the American legal system in order to free his people, something that had never been done before, never been tried before. 22 years earlier, a black man had gone to federal court in St. Louis and tried the same thing. He tried to sue the government of the United States for his freedom, but Dred Scott failed. But Standing Bear did not. Standing Bear succeeded, and why he succeeded and how he succeeded and the courage, the sheer courage behind his attempt to take on the entire government of the United States and to succeed is a magnificent story, a magnificent story that begins in the Ponca homeland. One of my favorite writers, and perhaps one of yours, a gentleman by the name of Wendell Berry. Anybody know that name? Wendell Berry, of course, a very famed Kentucky essayist, poet, short story writer, who once said, if you don't know where you are, you don't know who you are. I love that sentence because the economy, it's like the nucleus of an atom. There is so much packed into such a small space. If you don't know, you don't know who you are, if you don't know where you are, the entire concept of how place defines who we are. And I'm sure that's true of everybody in this room. You were born and raised where? Sydney, Nebraska. Sydney, Nebraska. And did 
growing up in Sydney, Nebraska, uh, in any way, shape, or form, uh, have any effect on your life, shape your life in any way, shape, or form? In what way? Just out of curiosity. I'm nosy. We didn't know we were poor. You know, we just yeah. lived our life, and it was when I got went to school I found out we were poorer than church mice. Okay, you were eight years old. Uh, you were you were a wealthy kid until you were eight. Okay, all right. Place, place. Nobody understood this more than the Ponca. Nobody understood this more than this man here and the 750 people that he was a a chief over, living on the Niobrara River in their beloved homeland. They understood exactly what Wendell Berry was talking about. If you don't know <laughs> where you are, you don't know who you are. They had sunk a deep cultural taproot into this beloved homeland for more than 200 years. They knew the deepest and best catfish holes along the Niobrara and the Missouri River. They were able to transform this beautiful lush valley into fields of wheat and corn and squash and pumpkin, so much so that in the years after the Civil War, when many white settlers, many of your ancestors perhaps, began flooding across the Missouri River onto the Great Plains, they had no idea what Nebraska winters were like. And if it weren't for the Ponca being generous with their agricultural skills, with their ability to take this beloved homeland and transform it into these lush fields, that fed not only the 750 people, but many, many white families. They understood the land. They understood how important the seasons were and how you planted in the spring and you went off on the buffalo hunts in the summer and you came back in the fall and harvested the crops and then you stored them away for the winter, the rhythm of life. And most of all, they understood the importance of their seven sacred burial sites, the seven places in the white chalk bluffs that help really frame and define the beauty of their homeland along the Niobrara River, along the Missouri River. Native people never leave the places where they bury their dead. And so the Ponca were deeply rooted into this beloved homeland that not one U.S. treaty said they legally occupied, but two U.S. treaties said this was their land, this was their home. This document says Standing Bear and his 750 followers of the Ponca tribe legally occupied this beloved Niobrara Valley. And so you can imagine, perhaps, on a cold winter day in January of 1877, when they were on their winter camp along the Niobrara River, a strange white man from, of all places, New York City, from, of all places, the Upper East Side of New York City, appeared in Standing Bear in the Ponca's winter village with this astounding announcement that the Great White Father, 1,500 miles to the east, wanted Standing Bear and all of the Ponca to pack up all of their belongings as fast as they could, carrying only with that with which they could move in a wagon or on horseback or in many cases on foot and leave this beloved homeland and walk 550 miles south to a place that was then defined as Indian Territory, later became the state of Oklahoma. Now we all know that no Nebraskan is moving to Oklahoma. <laughs> not then, not now, not ever, <laughs> not happening, not happening. And so when these Ponca people heard the words of this agent, representative of the government, a man who knew nothing about Indians in general and nothing about the Ponca specifically, came to announce that they were to pack up as fast as they can and vacate their beloved homeland, despite the fact they had two treaties that legally claimed them to be the legal occupiers, Standing Bear said, no, we're not going. His brother, Big Snake, 6'4", 250 pounds, in another era would have been a great defensive end for the Cornhuskers. In that era was the enforcer for the tribe. Scary guy, 
Nobody messed with Big Snake. He said, hell no, we're not going. So a detachment of soldiers came in, put handcuffs on Standing Bear and Big Snake, shackles on their ankles, threw them in the back of a rickety wagon, ran them 70 miles up the Missouri River and threw them in the stockade at Fort Randall. Because they had refused to leave a homeland that they had lived on for generations where their bed were <coughs> where their dead were buried, where the treaty said they could live. And after a few days, the detachment of soldiers surrounded their winter camp on the Niobrara River, and they began initially to withhold food from the 750 Ponca camped along the river in January of 1877, and after a couple more days, they began withholding water. And within days, the very young members of the Ponca tribe and the very old members of the Ponca tribe began to weaken, dangerously so. And they got the word to Standing Bear and Big Snake in the stockade of Fort Randall. Some of the old and some of the young were starving and dehydrating. And Standing Bear, like every chief in America, whose sole responsibility, in the end, a chief's sole responsibility was never to himself, was never to his children, was never to his family. It was to the welfare of the tribe. That was the bottom line value, commitment, that all chiefs had intrinsically. So Standing Bear gave in. He said they would move. He could not stay in stockade and watch as the very old and the very young of his tribe <coughs> passed away. He had no choice. So they released him. They went back to their winter village. And it was interesting to look at some of the primary source documents that emerged from this time, some of the newspaper accounts, some of the, the letters from white settlers that they could hear the Ponca people crying in the middle of the night in the run-up to the date that had been set for them to, with bayonets to their backs, cross the Niobrara River and begin walking 550 miles to a place that was totally abstract. The Indian Territory meant nothing to Standing Bear and Big Snake and their people in the spring of 1877, the Indian Territory, they knew where the best catfish holes were, they knew where the pumpkin squash were, they knew where their seven sacred burial sites were. Those were concrete proof of the land that they loved beyond all rational boundaries. Saying they were going to the Indian Territory meant nothing. Totally abstract. And settlers, many of whom they had fed, getting them through these harsh winters, could hear the Ponca village, could hear the people, men and women, crying in the middle of the night in those three or four days before May 19th, 1877, when they began this forced march 550 miles to the south. It was an unusually wet, chilly, damp, cold spring. The people had gathered up what they could. The Niobrara River was swollen from a lot of snow melt, had a swift current. As they tried to cross, some of the soldiers were swept off their horses. Some of the Ponca men went over and rescued them, got them back on their horses, got them safely on the other side of the Niobrara River. It was a point of pride among the Ponca that they had never harmed a white person. And their reward was to be stripped of their land and sent packing to some abstract place called Oklahoma. On the third day of this forced march, they crossed the Elkhorn River just outside of Neely, Nebraska, a beautiful little village that I'm sure a number of you have been to. That morning, after they crossed the Elkhorn River, as they began their fourth day of this forced march, a six-month-old baby Ponca girl 
by the name of White Buffalo Girl died of pneumonia on the bottom of a cheap, dank army canvas tent on the banks of the Elkhorn River on the edge of Neely. White Buffalo Girl's mother was so distraught, so mortified, so beyond grief, a woman who had lost her home, most of her belongings, her way of life, and now her daughter in 72 hours, was so immobilized by the sum of all that grief that she clung to her dead baby daughter all morning, wailing unconsolably, until finally her husband came up and got the baby girl out of her arms and he held him and tried to calm her down. And then he went and found the commandant of the army detachment and he begged him to go into the town of Neely and begged him to find the town carpenter. And he wanted to ask if the town carpenter would build a tiny coffin for his daughter. The commander of the forces agreed. They went into Neely. They found the town carpenter. He built White Buffalo Girl a tiny coffin. And the next afternoon, on the highest hill in Laurel Hill Cemetery, virtually the entire village of Neely came out to bury this Ponca infant. And as she was lowered into the grave, the father begged the people of Neely to treat his baby girl as though she were one of their own. He told them that Indian people never leave their dead behind, but they had no choice. There were bayonets to their backs. They had to keep moving. They couldn't stay. This was something they would never do unless they were forced to. And the only compromise he could come up with is to beg them to treat White Buffalo Girl as though she were one of their own. That was in May of 1877. If again we were to be magically transported to the Laurel Hill Cemetery, three hills rolling high above the Elkhorn River on the highest hill, we would see that there is one grave and one grave only in the summer of 2018 that is allowed to have flowers on it all year round. And more than 140 years later, that is the grave of White Buffalo Girl. More than 140 years later, the people of Neely have honored their commitment. And you go there and you walk up to that highest hill and you see the Elkhorn River in the background and you look at this grave and it is covered in teddy bears and dolls and coins and tobacco offerings and flowers. And if we were to have Mr. Laverne Houtman, the 87-year-old vice president of the Antelope County Historical Society, come up to us, and he does this all the time to visitors, and explain what this grave means to the people of Neely. And if we were to ask him, Laverne, okay, if you did this for 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, we get it, but you and your community have honored this commitment since May of 1877, what gives? And Laverne would simply look at you very calmly and very quietly, as is his nature, and he would simply say, well, we felt it was the Christian thing to do in the spring of 1877, and we still feel that way, and I don't ever see that changing. And I have heard him say that verbatim many times, many times. So the Ponca people buried the first of many dead who would die on this forced march. They kept going day after day, week after week, and finally in July of 1877, they moved across the border of Kansas and into the scorching plains of this place that would become Oklahoma. And to a person, they were shocked 
to discover that the government who had ripped them from their homeland and sent them on this forced march had prepared nothing for their arrival in Oklahoma. They had no farming implements. They had no food. They had no clothing. They had no places to live. So they began to congregate in the creek bottoms and they used their own tents, what they could fashion from the things they brought. And they clustered in a kind of heat and humidity that the Ponca people living along the Niobrara River had never experienced before. And these creek bottoms where they were forced to congregate because no preparations had been made were swarming with what? Within one year, July of 1877 to July of 1878, one third of the tribe had died of malaria. About 250 people had died of malaria within the first year. They had no idea how to treat this disease. There were no doctors, there was no medicine. And the Ponca people no longer knew who they were because they no longer knew where they were. They didn't recognize some of the plant species, some of the trees. They didn't recognize this red earth. They didn't recognize this heat and humidity. They didn't recognize stone formations. They had no idea where they were. They not only were divorced from the land, they were divorced from themselves, and now they were dying like flies week after week. Sometimes entire families would die in a week. And on Christmas week of 1878, Standing Bear's only son, a 16-year-old boy by the name of Bear Shield, lay curled in a fetal position on the bottom of a cheap, dank army canvas tent, dying of malaria. Standing Bear had invested, <clears throat> excuse me, an enormous amount of time, effort, and energy into this boy because he understood, which was his job as the chief, how important it was going to be for Bear Shield to protect the Ponca people as chief. The 100th Meridian goes right down the middle of Nebraska, divides Nebraska basically into an eastern half and a western half. All of the plant life west of the 100th Meridian, all of the animal life west of the 100th Meridian have adapted over tens of thousands of years to survive because on average there's 24 inches of rain west of the 100th meridian. So the plant species, a lot of the plant species have formed horizontal root systems very close to the surface. So the second one drop of those 24 inches falls, they absorb it before it evaporates. Other plants dig deep into the soil growing long vertical roots to try and get down into some moisture. The antelope in these open spaces, pronghorn antelope north of Scott's Bluff, standing in these open fields, have evolved ears that rotate like military AWACS planes and eyes that can see 270 degrees peripherally because they're standing in an open field and if that coyote 100 feet away snaps a twig, they have to hear that or they don't survive. They have to see that or they don't survive. The plants have to get that water or they don't survive. Standing Bear believed that unless they adopted the ways of the whites and merged them with traditional Ponca ways, his people were not going to survive. And Bear Shield was the one who was going to lead the Ponca people across that cultural divide. He's the one that Standing Bear had sent to school to learn English, to learn about the white man's government, to learn about the white man's religion. He was going to be the ones <clears throat> that allowed <clears throat> the Ponca people to survive. But now he was not surviving. He was dying. And before his eyes closed in death, he begged his father, the chief, to return his body 
to their beloved homeland and bury him in one of their seven sacred burial sites. About one o'clock on the afternoon of January 2nd, 1879, Standing Bear dressed the body of his only son in his finest clothes, clothing, wrapped him in a buffalo robe and put him in the back of a wagon. And on that afternoon, he and 29 others, including women and children, began walking 550 miles north back to their sacred homeland with virtually no food, virtually no money, virtually no winter clothing as a huge Canadian blizzard was coming in across the Great Plains. It was 24 below zero the first night the Ponca left. On that day, the government of the United States had entered into 376 treaties with the native people of America. And on January 2nd, 1879, they had broken all 376 of those treaties. O for 376 would be the scorecard. But this middle-aged Ponca chief was not going to break the word he had given to his 16-year-old son. So they began walking into this blizzard, 24 below zero. They had to tunnel into haystacks in the open field at night and stick the very old and the very young inside these haystacks to keep them from freezing to death. The men, the able-bodied men, rummaged for field corn by day, gathered up whatever field corn they could and boiled it over an open fire, and they ate the field corn, and they slept inside haystacks, and they kept going one day at a time, one week at a time, one month at a time, until they got to within a day or so of their sacred burial sites, of their beloved homeland. And they were brought in by their cousins, their very good friends, their allies, the Omaha Indian people, who gave them shelter, who gave them food. And it wasn't long as they began to recover that word got out that this renegade band of Ponca that had left the Federal Reservation in Oklahoma without permission were camped now on the Omaha Reservation, which triggered a deployment of soldiers from Fort Omaha that came in, got all 30 of the Ponca, turned them around, marched them to Fort Omaha, and put them in the stockade. And I know from the extraordinary amount of documentation that helps provide the storytelling DNA for this story. What <clears throat> Brigadier General George Crook was thinking as he stood on the porch of the General's headquarters at Fort Omaha in late March of 1879 watching this parade of prisoners being marched across the lower parade ground. The highest ranking military man west of the Mississippi stood on that porch at Fort Omaha, where I'm sure some of you have been on that late March day in 1879, and he was shocked, mortified at what he saw. What he saw were 30 people who were half dead. What he saw were women and children with clumps of skin hanging off their elbows and hanging off their wrists that looked like sacks of charred bacon. Their skin had been so severely frostbitten. They were so starving. They were so emaciated. And something began to tick inside of the highest ranking military man west of the Missouri Mississippi River as he watched his new prisoners being led across the lower parade ground. Because just three months earlier, this same man, Brigadier General George Crook, had been the commander at Fort Robinson. 
when Chief Dullknife and Little Wolf of the Northern Cheyenne tribe, who also had been forcibly marched to Oklahoma from their beloved Montana homeland, and decided they would rather die as warriors on the open plains than live another day in Oklahoma. And they began walking back more than 800 miles from Oklahoma to Montana. They had divided up into two groups. Little Wolf actually made it with his people back to Montana, but Chief Dullknife was captured in the Sand Hills, not far from Fort Robinson. And in January of 1879, they were confined in a barracks. They decided they, were, they would rather die on the open plains than live another day as prisoners at this fort. They broke out. They began to flee towards the hills outside of Fort Robinson, which I'm sure many of you have seen or been to. Uh, the troops were called out. 64 people were gunned down in the snow and the cold, many of them women and children, shot in the back trying to get back home. And this is something that George Crook never forgot. This is a sight that he never forgot. The next morning, these frozen children, these frozen women, these frozen men, their bodies stacked up like cordwood over an open grave. That's something he never forgot. And now it's three months later, late March, 1879, and he is watching. Barely alive people straggling into the stockade. And that set in motion this remarkable constellation of events that had one of them malfunction, had just one of these events not happened, I wouldn't be standing here, we wouldn't know about this man, but everything clicked, the stars lined up just right. You had the crusading reporter for what would become the Omaha World Herald, Thomas Henry Tibbles, who began writing stories about these 29, 30 Ponca prisoners in the fort. What crime had they committed? It was a middle-aged chief who just wanted to bury his teenage son in the White Chalk Bluffs along the Missouri River, as they had done for hundreds of years. And the government was stopping them. It was putting them in jail. They were half dead. A lot of people began reading these stories that appeared on the front page. They began reading them in Omaha, and it jumped across the Missouri, and then they began reading them in Chicago, and then up and down the East Coast. And this whole bandwidth of people from Boston to DC who had been looking for a new cause now that the abolitionist fervor had died down because slavery had technically been resolved. They were looking for a new cause. And they found it on the front page of their newspaper or in the editorial pages that in Omaha, Nebraska, a middle-aged chief and his 29 starving people were being detained because they had the gall to walk 550 miles with no food, clothing, <clears throat> money in the dead of winter to try and bury a 16-year-old boy. And those people weren't happy, and they began contacting their congressman. And pretty soon, the Jewish community in Omaha was stepping out of the shadows and hitting up white people for money to form a defense fund to hire lawyers to represent this middle-aged Ponca Indian chief. Now, that wasn't happening everywhere. But it was happening in Omaha in the spring of 1879. And before long, a lawyer by the name of Andrew Jackson Poppleton, you can't make these names up, you can't make this story up. Of course it would be Andrew Jackson Poppleton. He read about this outrage from Thomas Henry Tibbles in his local newspaper, and he was intrigued by the humanitarian aspect of the case, but he was really intrigued with the legal aspect of the case. And if you were in trouble in Omaha in May of 1879, the spring of 1879, whether it was jaywalking or uh, a felony, you would want Andrew Jackson Poppleton as your lawyer. 
after all. He was the dean of the Nebraska Bar. He was the first man admitted to the Nebraska Bar. He was a former mayor of Omaha. He was a former state senator. And in the spring of 1879, he was somewhat ironically uh, the lawyer for the Union Pacific Railroad. And he read about this, and he was intrigued. And then another extraordinary thing happened. He got a visit one day from Thomas Henry Tibbles who suggested he might want to accompany him and go out and interview Standing Bear. And before they could get around to doing that, the door <clears throat> in the editor's office of the Omaha World Herald uh, opened at midnight one day, and Thomas Henry Tibbles opened it, and there stood the highest ranking military officer west of the Mississippi. And I can envision how this whole thing went down. Here is George Crook, the slaughter of the Northern Cheyenne at Fort Robinson fresh on his mind. The view, the image, the surreal aspect of these 30 Ponca walking across his parade ground fresh in his mind. And he tells his superior, Philip Sheridan in Chicago, that he has these 30 Ponca prisoners. And he gets a telegram back from Sheridan, who had famously said a few years earlier, the only good Indian is a dead Indian, that his direct orders are to turn the Ponca faces south and march them straight back to Oklahoma the next day. And General Crook knew that was a death sentence. He'd been a military man all of his life. He'd been a heavily decorated soldier in the Civil War. He had fought Indians for the last 20 years. He was the highest ranking man west of the Mississippi. He knows the chain of command. He knows if his superior tells him to do this and it's a military order, he has to do it. And I can envision him walking back and forth at midnight in his lonely uh, quarters, this intense battle going on internally between his civilian conscience and his military conscience. There's a lot of that going on now. And he's thinking, I've got a direct order from my superior, but if I execute that order, I'm sending these 30 people to their death. So who am I? Am I a military man first and a human being second? Or is it the other way around? Where is my allegiance to? Is it to humanity or is it to the oath I've taken to obey orders? And after midnight, Brigadier General George Crook left his quarters. He went down to the stable. He saddled up a horse, and in the cover of darkness, he rode three miles north to the offices of the Omaha Daily Herald, soon to morph into the Omaha World Herald, knocked on the door, it opened. There was Thomas Henry Tibbles. Crook and Tibbles knew each other. Crook walks in, and he says, I've got an idea. I want you to come out and interview the prisoners, and then I think we should get a good lawyer, and we should sue out a writ of habeas corpus. This is the highest ranking military man in the American West encouraging the fake news media to come out and do a story, and then offering legal advice. That's something that has not happened before, and it's something that when I first came across the record of how this happened, I kept thinking, you know, I've been doing journalism for 30 years, and for 30 years I have been waiting for an email or a tweet or a knock on the door from the highest ranking military man west of the Mississippi, Joe, I got a story for you, I think you're going to really like it. Hasn't happened, not holding my breath. But it did in the spring of 1879. And that set in motion this extraordinary story. All of these stars lined up. All of these things had to go right. Fort Robbins had, had to have occurred three months earlier for Crook to have the guilty conscience he did about what had happened on his watch and he wasn't going to let it happen again. And he didn't. Under the cover of darkness, he alerted the local media that did his job. Thomas Henry Tibbles. This is what Standing Bear's story did. 
Standing Bear took each one of these people and elevated them to a position they had never been in before. Brigadier General George Crook was never a better military man than he than when he was acting on behalf of his conscience in the spring of 1879. Thomas Henry Tibbles was never a better journalist than when he was writing about this case involving Standing Bear and his 29 pocket trying to bury this 16-year-old boy and not being allowed to, being in prison instead. He was never a better journalist than when he did that. Andrew Jackson Poppleton took over this case and hired an up-and-coming superstar lawyer too, John L. Webster, to be his co-counsel. He was never a better lawyer. And after he died, after <coughs> Andrew <coughs> Jackson Poppleton wrote in his, in his memoir the relationship he had with George Crook, and George Crook had told him that this was his finest hour as a military man. Andrew Jackson Poppleton says in his own memoir, in a 50-year-plus legal career, the highlight of that career was representing this middle-aged American Indian chief on the third floor of the federal courthouse on the corner of 15th and Dodge Streets, where the Double Tree Inn is now. So all of this just happened to coalesce, just happened to fall into place. And so by the first week in May, 1879, this middle-aged Indian chief has his day in court because his attorney, Andrew Jackson Poppleton, and his co-counsel, John Lee Webster, had convinced the only federal judge in Nebraska at the time, Judge Elmer Dundee, to listen to them to listen to their case for a writ of habeas corpus, and this Indian-hating, grizzly bear-hunting judge who was out in the wilderness looking for grizzly bear, was a good friend of Buffalo Bill Cody's, can't make this stuff up, they needed him. They needed him to hear their argument for a writ of habeas corpus, so they, thank you. Thank you. So they sent trackers out into the wilderness to find the only federal judge that existed in the state of Nebraska in the spring of 1879. They located Judge Elmer Dundee. They got him back to Lincoln. The lawyers came in from Omaha. They presented their arguments for a writ of habeas corpus, which is in common English is really a it's a, it's a request, a declaration uh, that forces the government of the United States to explain in a court of law what legal right do they have to detain a prisoner. What legal right does the government have to keep Standing Bear in jail, preventing him from honoring the deathbed promise he had made his only son? That's what the court case was about. The government had to prove it had the legal right to detain Standing Bear and the 29 others. And Andrew Jackson Poppleton and John Lee Webster did not believe they had the legal right to detain him, and they were asking a judge to sign off on this. So they went out in the wilderness, they found him, they brought him back to Lincoln, he listened to their arguments, and he approved the writ of habeas corpus, somewhat shockingly. Because if you look at his decisions, he had never really ruled in anything that could be considered favorable to Native Americans. But there was just something about this case that everybody got some emotional traction from because of the humanity of it. So they had a date set, and they had a courtroom that was packed because they had been reading about this for weeks in the Omaha Daily Herald. Thomas Henry Tibbles had writing about it for weeks. Andrew Jackson Poppleton was the most well-known lawyer in Omaha, in Nebraska. So this courtroom on May 2nd, 1879 was packed with other lawyers, with community members, and they all wanted to see what was going to happen. Here was a middle-aged chief who was in jail, 
who just wanted to continue a two-day march to bury his son, and here was a government who was saying, not only can you not do that, you have to turn around and go back to Oklahoma so all these other tribes don't get the idea that simply because a third of their tribe had died, uh, they had a right to leave, or their children had died, they had a right to leave. You cannot set a bad example. We need to make sure that Standing Bear goes back to Oklahoma. That was the government's position. So I think, with your permission, this is another thing that uh, authors do too much of. They say they're only going to read a page, and then they end up reading 10 pages. But I am asking your permission to read about a page and a half and no more. Do I have your permission to do that? Okay. Uh, because I've got you to the point now where it's the climactic moment of the trial. And uh, I think rather than me just winging it, uh, I'll read you uh, two pages that I wrote in a remote fishing village in Italy because I didn't want anybody to find me or anybody to bother me because this is the most important chapter and I wanted complete concentration. So I found a remote fishing village south of Naples and it worked. Nobody could find me. Before the crowd began to file out, the judge made an announcement. Although the trial now had officially ended and the legal proceedings were finished, one last speaker, he said, had asked permission to address the court. He supposed it was the first time in the nation's history that such a request had been made, but he had decided to grant it, and he had earlier told all of the attorneys of his intention to do so. So the crowd settled back down and turned its attention to the front of the courtroom. They all saw him rise slowly from his seat, and they could see the eagle feather in the braided hair wrapped in otter fur, the bold blue shirt trimmed in red cloth, the blue flannel leggings and deerskin moccasins, the red and blue blanket, the Thomas Jefferson medallion, and the necklace of bear claws. When Standing Bear got to the front, he stopped and faced the audience and extended his right hand holding it still for a long time. After a while, he turned to the bench, and he began to speak in a low voice, his words conveyed to the judge by the Omaha Indian poet Bright Eyes. That hand is not the color of yours, but if I pierce it, I shall feel pain. If you pierce your hand, you also will feel pain. The blood that will flow from mine is the same color as yours. I am a man. The same God made us both. Then Standing Bear turned and faced the audience, pausing for a moment, staring in silence out a courtroom window, describing after a time what it was he saw when he looked out that window. I seem to stand on the bank of a river. My wife and little girl are beside me. In front, the river is wide and impassable. Standing Bear sees there are steep cliffs all around, the waters rapidly rising. In desperation, he scans the cliffs and finally spots a steep rocky path to safety. I turn to my wife and child with a shout, we are saved, we are saved. We will return to the Niobrara that pours down between the green islands. There are the graves of our fathers. So they hurriedly climb the path, getting closer and closer to safety, the waters rushing in behind them. But a man bars the passage. If he says that I cannot pass, then I cannot. The long struggle will have been in vain. My wife and child and I must return and sink beneath the floodwaters. We are weak and faint and sick. I cannot fight anymore. Standing Bear stopped and turned, facing the judge, speaking softly to him. You are that man. In the crowded courtroom, no one spoke or moved for several moments. After a while, a few women could be heard crying in the back. 
and some of the people up closer could see that the grizzled frontier judge had temporarily lost his composure and that the general, too, was leaning forward on the table, his hands covering his face. Soon some people began to clap, and a number of others started cheering. And then the general got up from his chair and went over and shook Standing Bear's hand, and before long a number of others had done the same. So the bailiffs asked for order, and when it finally grew quiet again, the judge said he would take the case under advisement and issue his decision in a few days. And then he adjourned the court shortly after 10 o'clock on a warm spring evening on the 2nd of May, 1879, in Omaha, Nebraska. Ten days later, the judge issued his ruling. For the first time in the 103-year history of the United States, a federal judge had declared that an American Indian from that point forward must be regarded as a person, as a human being within the meaning of the law. Prior to that, their legal definition was a ward of the government. After May 12, 1879, they were legally considered to be human beings, people, in the words of Judge Dundee, with the same constitutional rights and protections as the more fortunate white race. It was a landmark decision on many fronts. And among many Native people, they consider Standing Bear to be the Martin Luther King of American Indians. He tipped that first domino, the civil rights warrior domino, that eventually, although the wheels of justice move slowly, as we know, it would not be until 1924 that the government considered American Indians citizens. But that long journey began on the third floor of an Omaha courtroom in May of 1879 when this man, when this man, where does that kind of courage come from? Who does this? I mean, who does this? Who walks 550 miles in the 24 below weather of a Canadian blizzard with no food, money, or clothing simply to keep his word. This man evinces every value that Americans hold dear and cherish. And that's why I love this story. And that's why I want to do everything I can to continue to elevate his profile. And there is a lot going on right now that is uh, doing that, as you can see across the street this magnificent 12-foot statue. Early next year, there is going to be a national commemorative stamp issued in Standing Bear's honor. That statue that you see across the street, a replica is going to be installed in the nation's capital uh, sooner than later. We understand that for reasons nobody knows, Paul Ryan <laughs> has told uh, the powers that be in Washington that he wants Standing Bear specifically, that statue installed in the nation's capital rotunda before he leaves office in December. So apparently they're bending all kinds of rules to make that happen. As well they should. As well they should. Um, I typically make sure that I leave time for questions, which I have also done today. You have 30 seconds. <laughs> so they better be short. Uh, but we can also talk uh, afterwards. I, I don't know. I get, I get carried away with this story. And the, the sad truth is I could talk for another hour, but I'm not going to. Uh, so I am going to uh, just wrap this up by saying uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. And we will stay on, uh, and I will be happy to ask uh, any questions that uh, you may have. Thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs>